So a very good evening to you all. And we want to, to thank God so much for his mercies and his blessings in our life and giving us this privilege to join hands together as one big family from far and near. So um, it is a great privilege for us to meet and learn and equally um, tap from people who are resourced and then who are advanced in knowledge and equally have the kind of experience that some of us are trying to, you know, have. So I want to welcome you all and we are very happy to have you on board. There have been some small um, glitches and some small issues as far as connecting. We know currently the, the, the country is having some network issues and so on and so forth, but you guys have tried your best to join. It is a great um, honor to have you. Without much I do, I would want us to open it with a prayer. Um, I don't know how many of you who are Adventists, but it is open to, I mean, everyone, and then we want to begin with a prayer. So if you guys don't mind, I want to invite um, Pastor Andrew Suzerte to give us the opening prayer. Um, is pastor available? Yes, I am available. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege of meeting through this medium to teach ourselves on ways that we can progress and advance with our lives and then with our academics. We pray that you let this program go on successfully so that in the end it will be a blessing unto us and also it will be a blessing unto those who are facilitating. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor. I really, really appreciate that. Um, so once I, as I said early on, you are mostly welcome. And because we want to seek for excellence, um, Proverbs 16 verse 3 says that we should commit our ways and our plans to the Lord and our thoughts shall be established. So in this journey, if we commit our plans, commit our ways to the Lord, he will surely make the plans that he has for us come to fruition. So, once again, you are mostly welcome. I would invite Emmanuel Inkum to give us a background story as to who are these guys and how did you even come up with this? Okay. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Moderator, for this opportunity. So um, this is kind of um, uh, us UCC alumni who are actually in the in the states. So the idea of um, lifting was climbing. So as as we climb the ladder, we have to lift those who are actually down there or those who are also like want to climb. So um, this particular particular group. Um, was kind of created to offer um, support for um, the, the Adventist um, students who are in the state to help among ourselves, to offer counseling, to um, offer any kind of uh, um, assistance. And as part of the, um, the support mechanisms, we are to also um, provide support to the fellowship and the members in the entirety. So um, we, we heard a meeting, I think, um, last year, December, and we thought of how best we can um, make the group um, move forward. And as part of um, the initiatives or as part of the plans, um, support mechanisms for the fellowship and the members in entirety was actually proposed. And one of the support mechanisms for the fellowship is to, in the meantime, to have a study abroad webinar for the members to also lift them to also um come and join us. 
um, as it is said in tree, it's a man for epi or mudodwo. So um, that is um, how come that we try to um, actually implement this. So if you are seeing this study abroad um, webinar, it is not um, a one person's idea. It is not a one man initiative. It is a collaborative effort um, to actually support um, our brothers and sisters who are actually in Ghana. Um, ideally, this is a um, US um, context specific, but going forward, we are going to also um, involve or spread our tentacles by involving um, those in the other continent, like um, in the Asian countries and then in the um, Europe. So it wouldn't be um, based on um, US only, it would be a kind of um, a broad perspective. So it is um, Adventist brothers and sisters who have actually gotten the chance to, to study abroad through the grace of God. And as a matter of fact, um, we also want to sp spread this kind of opportunity to our colleagues in the fellowship to also um, navigate their way through um, the study abroad um, journey or trajectory in that regard. So I just advise that you just make use of this opportunity and then make the most out of the experience in that regard. Um, by ending, I will say that it was through this um, similar experience that I actually had a chance or that my interest in study abroad was rekindled. I think in when I was doing my service, there was a similar webinar, which was actually um, started by Pastor Andrew Suzote. And right from that, um, it also featured um, speakers from US. I think I remember um, one John Pueblo. And when the webinar ended, I started planning on my study abroad journey. And here I am. So we just urge that we are your colleagues, brothers and sisters, make use of um, the chance that are um, available. When you get a chance to come here, you automatically be part of the group, now as you see, um, um, alumni group in US here, you are going to be part to also share the, um, the plans that we have for ourselves and then for our uh, members out there. A lot has gone into the planning. A lot of time, resources has gone into the planning. So we just urge that um, make the most out of it. And at the end of the day, I will assure you that your questions will be get um will be answered, and. By God's grace, you will know how to navigate your way through study abroad trajectory. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Um, so as part of the program outline, as I said earlier on, <clears throat> it is now time for me to give you the overview of what we're going to share. The question of studying abroad. Um has been asked in different angles. And trust me, there are a lot that goes into it and you wouldn't be able to exhaust everything within these two hours. With that being said, we have planned to, you know, uh, contact resource persons who are advanced in knowledge and they can share with us some nitty gritties because this will be the very first section and subsequently we are going to share other ones too and we have um our first presenter would apparently talk about myth and importance you know there are a lot of myths out there as to um studying abroad is it for the rich alone is it for those who are first class this will be explained by uh resource person and is it even, even important to you know leave our home country to go to probably us canada to go and study is it, is it worth it this will be explained and the subsequent ones would talk about um document before you begin everything you need to get your i mean resources materials so what kind of materials are we supposed to have them 
before we can even begin this journey. These topics will be, I mean, explained by our, our speakers, like getting our transcripts, our CVs, and so on and so forth. This will equally be explained by our presenters. And then we also have one person who would also come in and explain to us how to transition. You know, most of us probably think that before we zoom into a PhD class, we have to get a master's degree before. Is it the case? Is it any, any way out that we can find our way through so as to get that? So these are some of the stuff that will be said to us this very webinar. Um, so I'm going to profile these speakers. I'm pretty sure the, the, the flyers have gone out and then you guys have known them, but just to give a quick um, details about them. Our first speaker is by name Andrews Achiampo. He is my brother. He is a very astute person who has a good heart to, I mean, support anyone that he has, uh, anyone that he comes into contact with. Honestly, he he um he equally pursued his master's taste bachelor's um uh, degree here in Ghana at UCC. So you know he is not I mean a different person who was born in China or Europe. He was born in Ghana here, and he also went through the same system as we find ourselves now. Um, he has had a lot of experience. I mean, working with. IT companies and so on and so forth. And currently he's doing his master's at um, Illinois Institute of Technology. And he is almost set to, you know, to graduate. He's going to speak to us as to why it is important for us to have this um, plan to equally study in abroad. Our second speaker by name, Ebenezer Sabbat Boache. He has a very wonderful name. I don't know why he's called Sabbat though. Maybe he was, he, this thing will be explained another time. Um, he is equally a good friend of mine and a person who has uh, equally spent enough time as far as navigating through this system is concerned. And as I speak to you now, he equally had his bachelor's degree in Ghana precisely UCC. Not, 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 not to just say that all those who are presenting are from UCC. Maybe it was by maybe coincidence. You know, we have other guys who came from Leg and so on and so forth. But those of us who are presenting now, because it is coming from NAS UCC. Um, he has also had experiences as far as, um, you know, coaching, uh, coaching people and so on and so forth are concerned. He has worked with UNESCO and so on and so forth. And as I speak to you now, he's a master's um, student at Indiana State University, a very wonderful school. And I think he's almost said to, you know, graduate. He's going to speak to us on some, some document. What are the stuff that we need so as to get this journey done? Our next presenter is by name, Daniel Apia. Jeche, if I got your name wrong, please forgive me. He is popularly known as Banky. I don't know what he's banking about, but he's also a very astute person who you call had his first degree at the University of Cape Coast. And as we speak now, he is also in the state doing his master's. So, you know, all these guys came forth through the same system that we have found ourselves now. So if these guys have been able to go through, it is it is an assurance that we can equally make it up there. Uh, he's also going to speak to us on some documents as well, because they are broad and we have tried our best to categorize them to so that they can speak on this salient point. Last but not least, the most in, uh, astute and what do you call it, profound lady among us. She is going to speak unto us why we can equally apply for a PhD right from our first degree. As we speak right now, she's having her PhD. Um, one second, she's having her PhD at Old Dominion um, 
school or college? University. University. Thank you. You know, why are we trying to bring all this together? These guys would be the best people to, I mean, uh, speak to us. So please stay tuned. Get your notepad, get your pens, and try to write something down. Because I'm sure that you, you wouldn't be able to exhaust everything and get everything right to your mind. But if you're able to write something down, it's going to help you a lot. These guys have had experience as far as studying abroad are concerned. And they're going to share with us. So without much I do, I, I want to invite our first speaker. My name, Mr. Andrew Sechiampon, is going to speak to us on some myth and importance of studying abroad. Mr. Achiampon, we are glad to have you and it is time for you to present to us. In the meantime, if you have any question you want to ask, please put it in the, in the chat box. If you don't want it to be open, you can just send it to me in my DM, Love Divine, and I'll see it and then it will be read for us to have a view of it. Thank you so much and have a good one. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Lord, for for the good work. Okay, so I wanna. Um, can you see my screen, please? Of course. Okay. All right. So, um, thanks once again for the opportunity, and I want to thank you know all the participants for for joining. So I'll just go right into the video. I mean the presentation. Okay, so uh, yeah, a lot has said a lot about me. Basically, yeah, that's me, I'm Andrews. I had my first degree at I, um, UCC and I did uh, IT. And then um, I came to the United States to study cybersecurity at uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. Also, uh, while I was at UCC, I got the opportunity to travel to Sweden, uh, specifically to Gothenburg University uh, to work sorry, to as an exchange student. All right, so I'll be presenting on the introduction of like study abroad. When we say study abroad, what does it mean? Now, let, just like Lord said, there's been many myths about studying abroad. I remember when I started to uh, apply, when even I had the thought to apply, I started asking myself a lot of questions because there were some myths out there now. I would debunk some of the myths and also uh, further explain uh, some of the media. So I'll also touch on the importance of studying abroad. And also, when I make the decision to study abroad, where do I start from? I'll touch on that. And then uh, I'll end by stating how we can effectively search for schools. All right. So when you say studying abroad, basically, for example, I'll use myself as an example. I was a student at UCC in Ghana. And so I decided to travel to the United States to, to study, right? So basically when we say study abroad, that's what it means. So when someone travels from his or her local, you know, country or native country to a foreign country to study. Now, I did a quick survey online and I realized actually it was based on, the research was based on the African students and why the African students, you know, they they try to travel, you know, to the foreign countries. And from the survey, we can see Nigeria, they have they have the highest, you know, students or population. This was specifically for US, not worldwide, just US. And from uh, Nigeria, we can see Ghana. Now the question is, why are people rushing to travel abroad and study? So that's something I'll touch on. Now, uh, fast forward, I want to touch on some of the myths. Now, I remember when personally I made the decision to uh, to travel abroad. You know, this is something that has been there for long. Now, we had this notion, personally, I had this notion that before you can pursue a study abroad, uh, in fact, you have to be a minister's son or your dad, should, your dad need to be someone who is rich. Now, some of us at the point we thought for, for you to even have the desire or the dream to study abroad, it is something for the rich. So if you're poor, you cannot even dream 
about you know traveling abroad. But today, I want to debunk that myth and say study abroad has never been and it's never an entitlement for the rich. It doesn't really matter what your financial, you know, you know, stability is. You have the chance. So this is something for everybody. So if you're if you're in school right now and you what you think you wish you could pursue that, and let's say you have in mind that you don't your parents are not rich and they do not have that much money to to help you, there is a way. Now we are Christians. And we believe that we can have dreams, but it is God who can establish those dreams, right? So I want to tell you, study abroad is not for the rich only. It's open for everybody. Now, there is another myth, and that is for you to be able to travel abroad and study, you need to be a first-class student, like this beautiful girl being applauded here in the picture. Now, I have to be careful touching this uh, particular myth. Now, it is not true that you need to be a first class student before you can study abroad. So that's one thing. Now, when I say it's not true, why do I mean by that? Or what do I mean by that? Majority of the schools here in the United States, they have like a cut of CGPA, you know? And from the research I personally did, even when I started applying for schools, I majority of the schools I touched on, I realized their cutoff grade was 3.0. So 3.0 to 4.0, you stand a chance. Even those below 3.0. Now, while debunking this, I want to also encourage, it is really important to have good grades. Now, why is that important? Let's say two people you know, are trying to apply for schools. Now, I have first class and the second one has, let's say, lower, right? Now, we all stand a chance, or not even lower, upper. Let's say the person has 3.0 and I have like 3.6 or 3.8. Now, when, even though, according to the requirement, the school says the cutoff grade is like 3.0. Now, it means we all stand a chance. If both of us are competing for one slot, ask, let's ask ourselves, who will be the right person to choose? Of course, it will be the one with the higher CGPA. So in as much as we are encouraging, I know majority of us are already in level 400. And unfortunately, our CGPA, they're not really looking good. We, we know we're not crossing the first class and no border. Don't worry. If you are within the second class upper, you still have a chance. But if you are still in the process, I want to encourage you today, please take your studies serious. I know, for, for instance, I want to talk to the tech guys. I remember in my class, we had, you know, like I did IT, so we always had this argument. Some, some of my colleagues were saying, as an IT student, you don't need to focus on grade. You need to focus on practical. Some of us, we, we stood for um, working for grades and then working for the practical. So we said there should be a balance. Now, unfortunately, some of our colleagues right now wish they could apply for school abroad, but their grades are not looking good, even though they have the skill. But trust me, the skill will not get you here. Of course, sometimes by God's grace, God through his infinite wisdom and ways can get you here. But I wanna state, please take your studies very, very, very much seriously. In fact, that's the, why, that's the reason why you, uh, you went to university in the first place. Now, some people also say, if you don't get a scholarship, you cannot pursue that study abroad dream. Now, it's not true. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, by God's grace, there are so many ways, even if you don't get a scholarship, you can still travel to the States and pursue that dream. I'm sure in the subsequent um, webinars, we will we'll touch extensively on that topic. But today, I want to tell you if, for example, when you apply for a school and you get, mostly they give merit-based scholarships. When you get that merit-based scholarship, Sometimes it's insufficient, but there are other ways 
you can supplement your financial you know, needs in order to be able to study abroad. So don't put that in your head. I know a lot of people, they've contacted me, they had schools, uh, they've gained admissions, but the scholarship they have is insufficient. I always tell them there is still a way. So put that in your mind. Now, many also think study abroad process is complicated. Personally, I remember when I completed school and I knew I wanted to travel. I told myself, for US, I want to try. Because imagine, we've heard of United States of America, everybody want to go to US. And so I thought US school system, the application process is gonna to be too complicated. I don't even wanna try. But no, it's not. The first thing is you just need to be someone who is willing to sacrifice time. Because for you to get the right school, the right form of scholarship, for you to get everything spot on, you have to do a lot of reading and research. So if you're someone who is willing to do that, trust me, you realize the school process is not complicated at all. Now, for our brothers and sisters in, I know, at UCC, you are blessed. In fact, now CCC by God's grace, and I'm saying this to the glory of God, we have many students here in the state right now, and we are all willing and ready to assist, right? So once you're speaking to the right people, trust me, you realize this process is not complicated at all. Now, some people think the moment you step foot in the United States, automatically you are rich. If that is the motivating factor, please, then you have to stop. Because I found friends, they, they came here thinking the moment they, they step foot on the United States land, they will be rich. Trust me, majority of them now, they are disappointed. And some will feel, some will even make a statement like, ah, now you is fine. Do you have not you can you as one cent? So don't, don't put that in mind. But tell yourself, this is a journey to advance yourself mentally, you know, uh, and even when it comes to asset, opportunity, US has a lot of opportunities, right? But don't put in your mind that you're coming here and automatically you'll be rich. No, trust me, uh, you'll be disappointed. So these are some of the myths I wanna you know, touch on. And I wanna end by saying school abroad is not for just a specific group of people. Everybody has a chance. Now, is it worth pursuing? Why is it important that majority of the students in Africa, not Ghana only, are striving so hard? Now, when you go to the embassies, you know, the places are crowded. Why is everybody rushing to, to travel? So I want to touch on the benefit of studying abroad. The first one is enhancement of knowledge and skills. This is really, really important, especially for some of us in the tech industry, you know, when employers are, when you go for interviews, right, they don't ask you questions based on what you just know. They'll give you a computer, then they'll give you a task, and they'll tell you to do something. So imagine uh, you've just memorized codes, and you're given a task. There's no way you'll be able to do it. So the good thing is, when you get a chance to travel to the United States, majority of the curriculum here is practical-based, and that's the best form of studies for every student. There's a saying that your network is your network, right? To the glory of God, some of us, we've met people uh, who are that are rich, that are resourceful, you know? And it's all because God granted us the opportunity for us to travel to the States. Now, some people we meet in class, majority of them have connections, right? So it's, it's really important. If you've not started thinking about traveling abroad, I want to, I want to encourage you today, start, because it's, it's something that's really gonna change your life. Now, another benefit of studying abroad, cultural diversity, and also it gives you the chance to explore. This is a picture of personally uh, myself when I got a chance to travel to Sweden. See, I met a lot of people you know, you can see me in UCC dress, right? So that's another a benefit of studying abroad. You meet a lot of people, you learn a lot, and that broadens your, your horizon, right? Another thing 
which is really important. Enhancement of career opportunities. Now, a lot of people make a statement. There are a lot of opportunities in the United States, in the United States and that is really true. One good thing I've realized is, you know, when personally I got to the United States, when after one year, I started applying for um, internship. And you see, majority of the companies here, I mean, majority of the companies, they are here in the United States, right? So you have a lot of options, even though it's not easy. But trust me, once you're good at what you do and you have God's approval, trust me, you God will make you find something. So that's another benefit of studying abroad. Now, improving on one's language. You see, when President Lord was speaking, you could you could hear some slides in there. You know, yeah, I'm sure it, when he was in Ghana, of course, I know he he's good at speaking English, but you know, now a lot of things are you know they've changed. So that's another thing. Your communication skills. One thing I uh, that has really helped me personally is in class, right? They put practical scenarios there and they tell everybody to share ideas, right? So it's something that has personally improved upon my communication skills. And we, majority of the schools here, when they give tasks, you work in groups. So that gives you the chance to know how to communicate among, you know, yourselves as, as a student. And that's one thing that's really important. For, for you to have. Now, another benefit I'll end pretty soon is to help build confidence and teach one how to be independent in life. I'm pretty sure majority of us in school, we are always with our parents. We've never even gotten the chance to travel somewhere for even like a week without our parents. Now, sometimes it's really important for you to be alone, live your life, and then know and understand who you really are, what you stand for, and the principles you have. And trust me, this is an opportunity that's going to give you all that you know, I'm talking about right now. Once you travel to the state, personally, I don't have, you know, there's no one here, I know, here in the state. I mean, where I am right now. Even though, yeah, I have the chance to speak to my parents and all that. But there are certain decisions I make for myself. You no, know, and that tells me, oh, sometimes I'm like, oh, I didn't know I could do this. I didn't know I could I could do that. So it's it's really important to to embark on you know this journey. And yeah, you can meet the love of your life. I've met a lot of people here. They of course they came to the United States just to study, but at the end of the day, they returned back home with a lady, you know? Yeah. So who knows? Maybe your partner. It's not in Ghana. I'm not saying put that in your mind that you're traveling to the state to marry. No, but I'm just saying that's another benefit because of course you meet a lot of people here. I'll end here. So these are the benefits. I just want to entice you today. You know, just have start having that thought. Now, what are the ways you can study abroad? Um, yeah, you can travel to the state and do an undergrad studies, an exchange program. Personally, I got that opportunity. Masters, PhD, professional certificate, internships, etc. So these are ways you can, you know, pursue that study abroad dream. Now, exchange program. So for the benefit of UCC students, if you never knew, I want to tell you today, there is a chance for you while you're in school to travel to the being it in the US, UK, uh, Sweden, I think UCC has, they have the affiliation with some schools, right? Now, I will share this link. Make sure you look for the Center for International Education Office. It's at outside. Now, go and start asking them questions about how you can proceed that. Because personally, I remember when I was in level three, when I was in 200, yeah, I think, no, 300, yeah, second semester. That's when God, through his, his infinite ways, made me, you know, get access to that. So I started reading about it. And then I think it was one of my brothers who encouraged me to pursue that. And yeah, by God's grace, I got a chance to travel to Sweden. So for that semester, I traveled to Sweden and I did that semester there. Afterwards, I came back. So I just want to tell you there is an opportunity 
for you to travel abroad and study while you are in school. So, yeah. Now, I'm ending. One thing that is really important, now that you've made a decision to study abroad, know that you have to start from somewhere. Now, where do I start from? The first thing is you have to decide on the major or the program you want to, you want to pursue. Why is this important? Trust me, majority of the people I've met here, they came here, they didn't really think about what they wanted to do. Of course, they wanted to travel. And so they didn't consider what program they have to pursue. You know, they just selected any program by God's grace, they got a visa and they, they traveled here. Now, there's this lady I spoke to. She her program was just one year. She completed the one year, you know, and now it's it's not STEM. So she has only one year to work, you know, and she's not getting a job. And so it's it's a big problem. So please, you have to take time and decide on the program you want to study before you even start searching for schools. Now I want to talk about two main categories here, STEM and non-STEM. Personally, I will be biased here and encourage. It doesn't really matter the department you are in right now. Start searching for STEM programs that applies to your department. Because I would really encourage that we told that link. I'm not saying don't go for non-STEM. There is also that opportunity, right? But especially for immigration purposes and after school purposes, I would want to advise. So read more into STEM and non-STEM. So I'm ending now. Ways to effectively yeah, search for schools through recommendations. Some of us are here by God's grace. When you reach out to us, you tell us your program, we will try and then get everything, you know, recommend some schools for you. Also, YouTube. YouTube was uh, a place that really helped me during my 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 search right so i want to tell you don't go to youtube and be watching for the sheldon only fine watch for the sheldon when you when you're free but make sure if you really want to pursue this you go there you ask youtube questions there are videos there a lot of videos there personally i have a youtube channel where i you know i also you know teach or touch on those stories also uh google search yeah you see make good use of the internet Right, especially when you want to pursue this dream. So um, that's it. When do you have to start preparing now, today? Start preparing today. That's it. So I want to conclude by saying you're strong. Of course, you see that little boy. Yeah, he's, he's telling you you're strong. And you can make it here. You can. Some of us, we didn't have the dream. Of course, we had the dream, but we didn't know God, you know, would bring us this far. So just... Pray to God about it, then start, you know, working on, you know, getting things done. And trust me, the sky is the limit. So thank you very much for your audience. Um, this is a very wonderful one. We really appreciate you, my brother. Thank you so much for um taking us through, you know, how best we can dispute and dis uh debunk those kind of myths and how important it is for us to apply. And you can only have that mindset to study abroad. We really appreciate you, my brother. Take care. And if you have any questions, as I said earlier on, please feel free to put them in the chat box. And I'm going to read them as far as uh, um, uh, meetings are concerned. So please don't hesitate to do that. If you don't want to make it public, like, I mean, everyone to see, you can just type on my name, Love Divine, and then share it with me. And it will be read for us to answer them. Thank you so much for your audience. Um, on our itinerary, we are going to have the second presenter, as I've already, uh, uh, what do you call it, profile him. He is Mr. Ebenezer Sabad Mwache. He's going to speak to us on um, the kind of documents we need to apply. Mr. Mwache, if you can hear me and if I'm audible, it's time for you to present to our ears and you have everything that you need to do so. Thank you for your time and I really appreciate you. Go ahead. Can you all see my screen, please? Of course. Right, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Yeah. Um, I thank the organizers and the leaders for giving me the opportunity to share 
um, what we have also um, gone through to our colleague uh, brethren back home, and we are hoping that this will give you the worthwhile information that you will need to as you navigate your way to pursue your next careers abroad. So, uh, that being said, uh, um, introduction has already been done. Hello. Look at it. You say what, please? No, 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 go ahead. Somebody was on okay. meeting. Sorry. Right. So, I finished my bachelor's and my first master's um, in Ghana, uh, all at UCC. I taught at uh, high school, Agona SD Senior High from 2018 to 2021. Then from there, I proceeded to teach at a NC College of Education at NC Western North from 2021 to 2022 before moving to the United States for uh, my second master's degree, which I am um, looking forward to graduate come May. So I've been tasked to deal with um, to deal with um, three main areas of importance. That's passport, CV or resume, and SOP, um, which are crucial to your further studies. So let's take particular attention. And in doing so, I'll look at the importance of passport. Yes, I will just, you will see my screen, but I will, I will run like water, as fast as water. I will not waste time so much so that you can have time, a lot of time engaging us with questions. So importance and what documents are needed, the application process, then on CV, what are they? Difference component tips to write effective uh, CV and, and samples. Then on statement of purpose or personal statement, uh, um, um, you can also add more letter of motivation. What are they? What are the difference? What are the components and the tips to write effective? Um, sorry, effective SOPs. And then I'll show you a sample. I am not. In doing so, I am not pretending as if you are, you you don't know anything about it. I know that you have a lot of, I mean, some of you may have a lot of information already. So I will not be like, I'm now coming to show what they are. You know, passport is one of the essential documents that you need to travel. It allows you to travel to and to and and back to your country to foreign language and sorry foreign countries and back to. Um, Ghana again. So it's also a proof of your personal and, and national identity. And most importantly, if you want to re-enter the United States, you need your passport. Yes, this is the passport that we're talking about. And so you need it. What do I need to apply for um, passport? You need your, you need a birth certificate as a proof of um, citizenship, whether you are Ghanaian or wherever you are watching from. And you also need other supporting documents like driver's license, national ID, Ghana card, like to say, or um, proof of profession, maybe letter of introduction from your boss. And if you're a student, you can also use a student ID. I pull out all this information from the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs website, so I am not just dishing out anything anyhow. These are what they are saying required for your application for a passport. What do I need in terms of the app application process? You just need to visit the website of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. If you're like a Ghanaian, I know that most other countries that are watching to Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, you may just ask, if you don't know, ask about what. So you visit the website, it's the, 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 the the process is just straightforward like that. And it, you, it's just like you are filling online form. So you go there and it gives you direction, simple to, to go through when you have all the needed materials. CV and resume. You have heard of CVs and resumes. You know what we, CV is about. You're going to uh, apply for job and graduate education too, you need your CV or resume, mostly. CV is what is the, CV is the big deal. Don't worry yourself about what, what do I need, what do I need. When you visit the program website or the school website, look for the re application requirement. That is a big deal. 
so whether they are requiring a, a CV that, but mostly you will see a CV slash resume. So don't bother yourself whether what you are designing for. What are the difference? CV is mostly lengthy. It has no uh, limit. You can just because you are itemizing everything that you you you've accomplished your personal education or whatever accomplishment whatever project you've done, any awards and honors, achievement and professional experiences. That's what you're doing. But a resume on a typical is a quick summary of your relevant education and experience because resumes are mostly used for job applications. So in the United States here, they use resumes, which they say that two, one or two pages maximum because they want you to tailor it to the job you are applying. So sometimes it means that not everything you have achieved will be important on your resume because they want the job specification. So what are the things that qualify you to, to, to this job? That's what they are looking for and what education background you have. So that is how resume is like. And um, in terms of content, um, I've already mentioned that CVs, um, details your your entire accomplishment in terms of education, professional careers, anything that you have accomplished that is needed because they need all your, your holistic view for your application, whilst the resume is a summary of education and relevant experiences that are important to the job you are applying or the, the program you are applying to. And you see, take note of this difference. In most cases, I mean, CVs are used for education purposes, education industry, because there's this term they call, in education, the longer your CV, like you see that kind of thing, or the higher your CV, the longer your CV, the, the, the higher your chances, because you know that, okay, you've got a lot of experiences. You are telling us that you have this, you have this. Not that you are just beating about the wish, but you should tell us a lot of accomplishments that may be relevant to the, the, the thing that you are applying to. That is why in, a, in, in a, uh, applic applying to uh, graduate school, they mostly prefer your CV. What are the components of CVs and resumes? Contact information, education, work experience, grant, fellowship, academic awards, leadership position, ex research experience, publication, conferences, seminar, workshop, attended, online and certificates. These are the important things. Now let's talk about tips to write effective CV and resume. Use the same format throughout. Use the same format throughout. So if you say that you are doing this, um, maybe my name, Ebenezer Boache, uh, um, um, uh, how, how do you say? Your education uh, level, education, let me say education, education then, your immediate educational level first, then follows like in that order. So that's how you should use a format that you choose because there's no one format. So if you choose a particular format, use it throughout. Use the font size, I mean, appropriately, font size 11 and convert to PDF after everything. So you have to make that when you convert it, it will be very readable. Use actionable words or verbs. So what are actionable words or verbs? You have to tell us things you did. So um, for instance, when you are talking about uh, um, your administrative um, roles, you can just say um, documented departments, um, blah, 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 blah. So documented is, a, is, a, is an actionable word. It tells us your knowledge in documentation as an administrator. These are the things that I'm talking about. Use quota and percentage and numerical values where possible. For instance, I taught a class of 25 students, or I let's say if it, uh, uh, um, is, if you say you can also say you are as a teacher or you handle final year students, you can say that I organize tutorials to 400 final year students during their maybe WASI preparation. And out of that, you see that these are actionable and using quota for them to know what you're talking about. Yes, this, you deal with this number. It does not necessarily mean that code like 4,000 or 400, no. They want to see what you've been doing. So make it, and also make it clear and readable. Make it simple, but informative. 
that is CV and resumes. I I charged on getting you a, a sample to go through. You can see that John Smith has their contact information here, education, PhD, psychology, University of Minnesota. So you can see all these, these are, then you see concentration, brought about, brought their concentration, dissertation title. And that is how, and they also brought their dissertation advisor. These are important or essential information. And it is all, we, we call it academic CV, okay? Because you are telling us your academic achievement. When you are building academic CV, bring about your academic achievement first. They should be on the top because it is school you are applying to. Let's say not a job. That is why I specify that on the jobs, they mostly require a resume, not CV, not too much, plenty of things, unless you are applying into education industry. So in this, you are applying for education. So let us know what you have achieved in terms of uh, uh, educational accolades. And then you also proceed, if you've not attained any um, um, experiences in terms of uh, um, research, you bring your working experience. So here you can see that the person was explicitly stating their risk, um, um, teaching experience, research experience, publication, this is the continuation, presentations, grant and fellowship, awards and honors, professional membership, relevant skills. These are how you build your academic CV. You may not also have these same experiences. That is why it is important that it should be relative, tailored it to your experience, what you have you achieved. Don't go and lie on your CV because you know that <laughs> someday you may be called to talk to what you, you have on your CV and you'll be found wanting. Yes. Um, these are what I have for you in terms of CV. Now let's go to SOP. This is the crucial aspect of your application. I was watching one professor who, who has been in the admission committee or was on the admission committee of um, public uh, health in one of the universities. And he was, she was saying that every admission committee the thing that they want to read about you is your SOP or personal statement. This is it. It is not so much about your CV. You have achieved a 4.0 first class, but they want to see you because it is here that they can relate. They, they can communicate. You are talking about yourself, your achievement. They don't really find interest in reading CVs. Yes, everyone may have a first class, second class, class, whatever. But how are you conveying what you have achieved to the admission committee? That is the important and crucial aspect of it. So a statement of purpose sometimes referred to as a personal statement is a critical piece of graduate school application that tells admission committees who you are, what your academic and professional interests are, and how you add value to the graduate program you are applying to. This is it. And so you have heard, you may have heard of uh, statement of purpose and personal statement and uh, in some other jurisdictions, motivation letters, they all have some common core component that you they require. But let me establish uh, some basic differences. In terms of um, focus and content, statement of purpose primarily focus on your academic and research interests, goals and motivation for pursuing specific graduation pro, uh, graduate program. So you can see that we're talking about futuristic. Take a certain note. In statement of purpose, it talks about futuristic. <laughs> what do you want to do? What are you aiming? What are you bringing on board? What are your goals, interests? So you can see futuristic. This is what I am looking forward to. And this is what I ultimately want to learn. What about personal statement? It's a, it's a more personal narrative that explores your life experiences, challenges, and personal journeys that have shaped your decision to pursue a graduate school. Now, let me here, let me provide a simple example of an introductory aspect of, of personal statement that, that establishes a difference between personal statement and um, statement of purpose. So in statement of purpose, um, one, one, one thing that my, my, my doctor has made it um, being part of me, it's very simple. So I am talking about statement of purpose. Listen to how I'm writing my introduction. I aspire to be a scholar practitioner 
in student affairs and higher education after my program or after my PhD in higher education. You see that how I, I introduce? So here I have told the people, this is my goal. I mean, it varies, but tell them if you are not going to, I'm not saying use mine, but you, because I know people have a very nice way of writing, conveying message, people have good types of writing. So tell them what you are seeking. So in all, you are telling them what you want to, what your, your future career is. So then you can further say that with this career aspiration, I aim to help students navigate their own uh, on campus um, life experiences and help um, um, their overall um, student success or overall student um, 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 college experiences. This is it. Then you also further say that my educational background, works experience, and leadership experience qualifies me or makes me a great fit for this program. That is it. That's the introduction. So in all, you have captured your whole essay in, in, a, in the first um, paragraph. You are done, period. However, another person can take it from a different angle, bringing on board what research has established, what people have done. So UNESCO, I'm, um, I'm saying another thing in terms of SOP. UNESCO calls upon student affairs professional to respond to the high demand of student experiences on campus after, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. To this call, so you see how I am conveying this. Then from there, you tell, this is what you are aiming at. People are letting, the, so you are, you are catching the attention to read that mm, this guy has something to ask. Now, on the other hand, in terms of um, personal statement, I can start by saying my narrative. From my infancy, I have lived and experienced in a multicultural or multi-diverse cultural environment in Kumasi back in Ghana. So you can see Kumasi is the center of, of, of culture, like people from different backgrounds live. So living there, you have experienced this thing. Here, I am driving an, an agenda. It is still, it also still fits into my program of study. It is not that you are only narrating your experiences that are vast, that are apart from, from the program of study. You should couch your uh, personal statement to have to be in line with the program of study. In this, I face several challenges understanding people's languages other than mine, but still I enjoy people talking about their different ways of life, how they do things differently, the different dishes about people and the different cultural narrative people have to tell us. As such, I mostly go to debates and program to enjoy the different cultural perspective that I do not have. This is personal statement you're talking about. You see, I'm not talking about my, my educational achievement. I am talking about my personal experience. Here, I am driving an agenda talking about multicultural and international education. So you can see that I am talking about my personal narrative, but it is arriving into my program of study that I am looking to PhD in more masters in student affairs with a specialization in multicultural and international education because multiculturalism talk about different perspectives, different narrative, different cultures. And so I'm telling you my Kumasi experience that I live in Kumasi where different people come together and you see different sort of uh, languages and different, that is how the difference between statement of purpose and uh, personal statement. In terms of purpose and audience, Statement of purpose is designed to convince the admission committee that you have a good fit for the program and that you have the necessary academic preparation, research skills, and intellectual curiosity to succeed in the graduate program. But on personal statement, it aims to tell the admission um, committee your holistic understanding of, of, of the, yourself and how you think that all this holistic understanding of yourself fits or makes her shape your understanding to uh, of what you are you you are aiming for or or what you are you want to do. 
Then we come to the tone and style. SOP is written in formal academic tone, highlight your research uh, interests, goals, and qualification. Um, whilst personal statement can be more personal narrative style, it's, it's, it's like, it, it gives you the freedom at least to explore different, you tell about the challenges you have faced, personal growth, how you have, you have overcome certain lifestyles. And here I will borrow, um, I'll borrow uh, Andy's point that it is not only about the fact that you have you have acquired uh, uh, um, you have a, how do you why yeah about the fact that you have acquired a first class but let us know how your first class um, is important to you or if you have second class maybe maybe you you think that you are more than first, second class but what challenges that you encountered that made you achieve what you have achieved that is the difference. Now, what are the components? Introduction, I've already talked about that. Academic and research interests, motivation and goals, relevant experience and achievement. What are your fit for the program, future plans and contribution, and you need to bring conclusion. In terms of tips to write effective and strong statement of purpose or personal statement, read from the school's website, mostly Almost every school give instruction how they want the things that they need from your personal statement. Sometimes, let me let me uh, be back to, to let you know that sometimes uh, um, um, some schools, they are used interchangeably. Some schools will require personal statement. But when you read from the school's website, you can see that the requirement combines both personal statement and statement of purpose. So you should know. You read to know what they are requiring you to do. If it's a personal statement, yes, you should know that it's a personal statement, but these are the things that they want. Tell us about this. They have some bulletins from the program website about what they want you to do. So that, but in all, the common sense in the balance is building them together. Let them know who you are, just a short introduction about yourself. And then go on with the others Tell us about your the, the uh, things about yourself in the introduction. If it does, they do not require both because some schools require both. Others require each of them, like maybe a personal statement or a statement of purpose. And your essay should be chronological. Provide examples to support your point. I will show you in in the in the in, in a few seconds. Um, provide examples to prove your your point. Pro your essay should be chronological. Call it Kali audit, sorry. <laughs> it should follow one from the other. You should link them together. So how does this experience link to this? And, and people should be able to reason that where you are coming from and where you are arriving. It should also be coherent. Now I'm showing you this. A statement of purpose, Kwame Bwache, used, I, I am Kwame Bwache. I am just an um, <laughs> anonymous name that I created, but my, I am Kwame Bwache. Kwame Bwache used uh, to apply for masters in law in the University of Amamoma. Listen, look at the introduction. Like I told you that people have their different ways of introducing themselves. During the high school, I was inspired to pursue a career in law after taking part in a debate in a history lesson. You see how he has taken the academic trajectory to let us know where he's going. So I made, uh, I made this uh, uh, um, um, comment that introduces career and what sparked his career aspiration. Then go on to the second paragraph. This curiosity and determination make the right to make the right decision and to form argument based on evidence inspired me to complete an undergraduate course in history in 2017. You see how he's building the, 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 the academic trajectory in line with uh, um, the program that he's the, uh, is applying to. So undergraduate coursework and career. I am talking about career in terms of law. You know, lawyers, they use um, evidence um, to make their case. So what evidence can you use to make informed decision, to prove your law, your, your, your argument? Because you go to the, uh, you go to, um, um, the uh, court and you are arguing with the other lawyer. The one who is able to convince best is the winner. And the person is telling us what he's been doing all, all, all this while. So you see, that's what 
um, let me go from here. However, then they tell you, you see, he provided example. For example, I completed models on European art history where I use evidence shown in painting from the early modern period to show how social inequality took place. But in another module, I examine how effectively the Nazis controlled the, the press during World War II. These experiences show how I can take a variety of subject matter and form a compelling argument based on the fact provided. Wonderful. So they provide evidence. This is a law, but you see how he's using his class in history to demonstrate his ability to be in the law school. This is so wonderful. However, the main, my, the main passion in my undergraduate coursework was social history. Now, I took a keen interest in hearing first-hand accounts from everyday people on the experiences during the Great Depression, and I wrote my thesis on this subject. I used the evidence given by people during the Great Depression to argue how the action of the masses to migrate and mass had more impact compared to government intervention. I also completed a presentation on my findings and answering questions from doctorate-level tutors on the subject and receive a distinction in my research. I took my heart for Pamwati here. So this is how you should build your argument. You see how he is building history and connecting their research and academic interests and, and showcasing their research interests in the field. It tells their academic prowess. And it goes on to go on, go on to establish that no, this guy is, is too marvelous, so wonderful that you, you love to hear over and over again. And it goes on after after their studies, he Kwam Wachi says that they uh, they did their um um national service in a law firm and tells what they, they did at that office. And finally, they conclude by telling us the personal attribute, summarizing everything and telling the personal attribute of this application of themselves that they think that they are a great fit for the program. Yes, I think that you really well understand it. Let me quote uh, 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 this from Eliana Roosevelt that my favorite doctor um, Godwin always tells, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Believe it, you can do, no matter whether first class, second class, upper or lower. Even just yesterday, I was watching YouTube, a guy who, who had passed in chemistry and now doing the masters in the United States. These are the one or four things. Pursue your academics, learn hard, but believe that you have something worth in you to, to continue your progress. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sabat Boachi. That is a very wonderful one. And of course, the future um, apparently belongs to those who believe and have so much confidence in their dreams. They will surely come to fruition. We really appreciate that. A lot of you have been sending your questions to me in the DM. They'll be read and then um, those who are equally looking for the exchange program link, I think um, it has been shared. If not, I can just do it once more to also have a look at it. Um, on our next presenter, we are going to have the second part of documents that we are supposed to use for these applications. And we are going to be enlightened by our own brother, Daniel Apia, properly known as Dr. Banki. Uh, Dr. We appreciate your time here, and it's time for you to, I mean, present to us. Thank you so please, much for. Please, um, can you hear me? Of course. Okay, thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to be on this program. Um, thanks to the organizers too. So, um, Daniel Apia Dechi, and um, I went to um, UCC. I completed my bachelor's at UCC and did my master's at Peugeot University, and I read communication, and currently I'm doing my PhD in journalism and communication, specializing in gaming, virtual reality, and disability in the African content. 
So today we're going to talk about transcripts and um, and some other uh, materials we'll need for our applications. So zooming straight, I'd like to add something. My colleagues said they 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 said um, they made good points, and I'd like to add add my point or my view to it. So um, talking about volunteering, I think Andrew said something about it, and I really like that a lot. If you've been following me, I like volunteering a lot, and which is very very much important. Please, if you don't do that, try your best and join any organization you find yourself just to you know volunteer help and get some skills and these skills would would help you um spice your cv or anything you be writing or your sop so please take note of that and also um just like what he said with your sop to avoid um some uh okay fine you can share your life experience and other things but please let's avoid the issue of you coming from africa poor please poor family poor days poor that and that um, you know, my, I had a conversation with my supervisor who is on the um, the admission board, and he asked me this question, um, Daniel, why is it that everyone, um, like, coming from Africa, India, SOP, most of the SOPs I read, um, a lot of them are saying that Africa is this, Africa is that, like, they are not really touching on the research they want you to do. So those um, elements, when we see them, we just push it aside because we see that, okay, struggle is everywhere, and people, a lot of people are, are suffering, but... Um, you need to make a point that this is what you want to do and not trying to uh, appeal to pity or something um, from your perspective you find yourself. So please, let's take note of that. So um, with the transcripts to um, please, if you've not applied for your transcripts, make sure you do that as soon as possible. I would advise you to do that as soon as possible. Do your best. I, I don't know uh, how much it costs in Ghana now. Um, during my time, it was 50 cities, but I don't know. But, uh, please um, do your best uh, to apply for your transcripts um, before you graduate, especially if you're final year student, so that it can help you prepare your document very, very well. And also, then um, you would also need to know um, if you're using official transcripts or unofficial transcripts to apply for your program. So most programs, they would accept the unofficial transcript. You can just go to your UCC portal and just um, download your unofficial transcript and use that. But, you know, sometimes if that is if you don't have the money now to apply for the transcript, um, for the official transcript, you can still use your unofficial transcript to apply. And also, look, you need to look at the requirement from the university. Okay, so what are they requiring from you? Are they requiring you, you submit an official transcript or an unofficial transcript. If it's an official transcript, please do your best to get your um, transcript submitted uh, and add that to your uh, your application. So now, before you apply for any program, um, you you should make sure that you you ask. Please get in touch with the department coordinator. You go there, go to go when um, you go to the department's website or the school's website. Look for programs. You go to programs, you, you look at the department you want to do, look first thing, department coordinator, look for his email, blah, blah, blah. Ask him, so this is it. I am A, B, and C from Ghana. I want to apply for this program. This is my CGPA. Am I qualified to apply A, B, and C? Okay, yeah, go ahead. He or she would, would reply to you. I mean, it's good. Um, go ahead, you need to do this. And if you are required to submit a standardized test, like um g like the gre and uh standardized test like the gre and um, um that is graduate management admission test if you are required to submit this test you would you would ask um that um can you get a waiver can i get a waiver is it possible i can get a waiver because i'm coming from ghana uh, english-speaking country and uh, I've, I've been doing english right from infancy and i think that i have control over the language you tell them about that can I do it? Okay. They may waive it for you, but some schools may not waive it. Some schools are very, very, very strict with that. So with the standardized test, please just reach out to the department coordinator. Explain things to, to him or her. You are human being that this is your situation. You want a waiver. You you, you think that you don't have, you are not in um, the financial capacity to, to maybe to write GRE now or to write any test now. For example, myself, I, I tried, I started writing GRE, but it was a little bit difficult for me. So I, I paused and I, I wrote IOTLS and 
but I didn't use it for my application. I also wrote Duolingo. I didn't use it. I, I use this for all different applications and other things. And all these um, graduate exams are financial consuming and they are a lot. It's going to take um, like a lot of money. So if you you are planning to do something during your service too, you can start saving towards it if you want to do something. But you know you can afford that. Please, um, you just do your best to um, at least reach out to the department and let them know that, okay, so this is it. And with your transcript to some departments would also require for evaluation. So we have evaluation like the West Education Service. We also have the ECE and we also have the um, IERF. Um, it depends on the university. Some of them would require West, but the West, West is the dominant transcript eva evaluation agency we, we all know. And it's um, now, I think they have increased it also. Uh, I suppose it was one fifty dollars or so, and it's a little bit expensive. It's also expensive, and that one too, you can get. So I had um, a colleague who had an admission funding and everything, and they required him to uh, to evaluate his transcripts, and they gave him uh, I think some month a duration that okay you have two months to do that or three months to do that. You should do that by the end of the semester or by the end of this month, and he wasn't able to afford the money, and so at the end of the day they took um, the funding and everything from him. So please. Um, do your best to, and also, it also depends on the university you are applying to and the states you are applying to. Some state or some university require, no matter what you do, you can get 100% scholarship. They require that you evaluate your transfer. So the evaluation is that they, are, they, they want to compare your credit hours and also affirm that the grades you had are like it's valid. Like um, you, you didn't, you, you, you had your grades through an authentic means and then, uh, and also it's equivalent to the program you are coming to do in the United States. So that's the main reason for the West evaluation. So if you know you don't have money for that, please do your best to um, look at other schools who do not take the West um, transfer, um, transcripts evaluation. So now looking at recommendation letters, uh, recommendation letters, we all know, um, please, it's also depends, um, please do your best and um, create a very good relationship with your supervisor, your advisor, your friend, anyone you, you, you think will be very, very good to, to write a recommendation letter for you. And you should start creating that connection. If you don't have any connection with them, please do your best to do that. Start creating connections with them and with their recommendations, don't worry, sometimes to the ask for academic recommendation letters, which is um, the popular one, or maybe if you work somewhere, you did your service somewhere, you may, they may also ask for that one to, you know, your work um, recommendation or social service recommendation and other things. So with a recommendation, make sure that the person knows you very, very well. And if this person or if this professor knows you very, very well, sometimes they tell you that, okay, um, Kwame or Banki, write this and submit it to me and, and I'll add something to it and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll submit your recommendation letter uh, for you. So that's what you need to know and you need to make sure that you pre-inform them and pre-inform them because sometimes you, last minute, you call your professor that, okay, professor, write a recommendation for me. I tell you, it's very, very difficult. Sometimes they'll just write anything anyhow. And I've, um, like some professors have had that conversation with me before, um, telling me that the students come to them, they come to them um, at last minute, that, okay, submit this for me. And they just do anything anyhow, they just because um, he's in a rush and he, 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 he doesn't know what to write and he doesn't know the students too. So make sure that the, the professor knows you well and you also know him very, very well. That's because it's that's one of, just like my brother said, recommendation is also going to be one of the, I mean, the cracks or the strongest aspect of your, uh, your, your, your letter, your ad, uh, admission letter. So please make sure that you have a, a very good recommendation letter from your department. So with that said, because I would have a lot of questions and a lot of things, uh, I'm keeping it brief and I'm going to end it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senior Daniel Apia. That was a very quick one, and but very detailed. I mean, if you were listening very well, you could know that he had, you know, touched on the salient aspects of what we 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 asked him to talk about, and the the, the very intricacies have been shared. Uh, with before I forget, um, I'll be glad you share your your slides with me so that 
we well, can uh, share them uh, to those who weren't able to join or probably those who were <laughs> not able to get everything that was said in front of the network problem. Um, can, can, can you mute these people? Sorry about that. Okay, so we go ahead and have our last. Andrews, if you can meet those who are not. Andrews, hello, Andrews, can you hear me? Yeah, bye. Hello, Andrews. Please, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Right. Yeah. Can you go ahead and then probably mute those who are unmuted? Yeah, sure. You see that. Um, we go ahead and have our last presenter. He sees apparently she is the only person amongst us who is a, who is a female, but very indefatigable, and you know, she's well resourced and well experienced and. She's going to share with us how we can transition from a first degree to a PZ. Is that even possible for us to have that? Maybe, I don't know, but she's well versed in that area and we want her to share with us. So please, um, Doris Anderson, if you can hear me, it's time for you to share with us um, what we need to know as far as transitioning to from, from PhD to, from first degree to PhD is concerned. Please, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, Before Doris comes up, can Banky, can you please stop sharing? So I share something there. Thank you. Please, you can take over. Okay. okay. So, um, so um, I just wanted to um. Hello. Hello. We can hear you. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> Sorry. So yes, um, my name is Doris Anderson, and um, I am currently pursuing my PhD program here in um the US. I just wanted to touch on a few things um that my other presenters didn't touch on in their presentation. So the first thing is transcript. Yes, you would need your official transcript. Every university requires official transcript. You can use the unofficial transcript for the application, but when you gain admission, you start classes, your official transcript need to be submitted by your university to the current university before the first semester ends. So take note of that. And then regarding the standardized test, they can be waived. It is not compulsory. Some universities can waive the GRE or the GMAT for you. And then regarding language proficiency for the US and English Canada and then UK, because you are from Ghana and then the official language is English, the language proficiency can also be waived for you. But for other countries whose official languages are not English, like Germany, um, China, places that speak French, you would be required to take a language proficiency exam. And then the evaluation um, that um, Banky spoke about. For evaluation, when you do it, it increases your CGPA. So for those individuals whose um, GPA is quite low, let's say you don't have a first class and the university is requiring a first class. When you do the evaluation, it raises your GPA up. So you can go from a 2.5 to, well, 3.0 is stretching it a bit, but you get what I'm saying, yeah. And um, you can study abroad, even if you get a pass for your bachelor's, but it doesn't mean you don't need to study. You have to study and then get the grades. And then also, it is not compulsory for you to study abroad. You can stay in Ghana and all these things that we are talking about can also apply to studies in Ghana as well. And then one last thing that I also wanted to touch on, it is not um, only your lecturers in UCC that can write recommendation letters for you. 
So for some people who are like finding it difficult to get um lecturers to write recommendation letters for you, you can equally ask other people. They don't necessarily have to be the ones teaching you in school. They just need to know your academic background and what you can do. That's it. Okay, so um, I will briefly talk about what um, I have to talk about today. I'm transitioning from bachelor's to PhD directly. Well, so there are two main pathways. You can go through graduate studies and then move to postgraduate studies, which is um, PhD. Or you can move straight from the bachelor's degree to the postgraduate studies. And um, usually the uh, when you are transitioning from graduate studies to the postgraduate, that is much easier because you already have the graduate experience. You're able to do research. So it is easier for you to transition. But the difficulty lies in when you are transitioning from directly from the bachelor's degree to the PhD. It is usually called the direct PhD or the PhD track um, program. But hey, the Bible says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So we can definitely move from the bachelor's degree to the PhD program. And there are actually most people, I, I know about, uh, I know roughly about 20 individuals personally who moved straight from the bachelor's program to the PhD program. So it is doable. That means we can do it. The first thing that you need to consider is to have a strong academic background. Um, if you are considering a direct PhD program, you typically need to have an exceptional academic record during your undergraduate studies. That will include like having very high GPA score and strong letters of recommendation and evidence of research potential or academic achievement. The PhD program is um, solely research-based. So if you have no experience doing research and all you cannot prove that you can do research on your own, then PhD isn't for you. You, you wouldn't want to um, go there because it's going to be very tedious. But if you, if you had moved to the master's degree, it makes it easier because master's, you do research, you have to write your thesis before you finish your master's um, program. So it makes it easier. You already have the experience and you easily transition there. But if you are moving from the bachelor's degree to the PhD, you would need to um, prove, provide evidence that you can indeed do a research experience. So now that you are in school, whatever um, assignment that is being given to you, that could present itself as um, a research experience for you. And the dissertation that you write um, at the end of, um, I think in level 400, that is also a research experience for you. The next thing is you need to have a clear research interest. Most universities would require that you have, uh, you know what you want. It is not now that um, someone is going to guide you on where to go. You need to have a clear um, research in interest. You need to have a clear idea of um, potential dissertation topics that you would want to um, um, do. Because um, for PhD, you do two year compulsory coursework where you take classes, you have lecturers teaching you, you write exams at the end, and then you are passed. After the compulsory two years, that is when you go into pure research work. You would have to find your own topic. You would have to do the research. You gather your own data, do your analysis and everything and then you present it for it to be approved. So admissions uh, committees will be looking for candidates who demonstrate a strong alignment between their research goals and the faculty expertise within the PhD program. If the university that you want to apply to, if the, that particular program, the instructors there, their research areas do not align with the, your research interest, then I don't think you gain admission to that particular university. So it is important that you know that, okay, this is my research interest. I want to do something about immigration. The department that I'm going to, is there any faculty, any faculty member who 
um, is in that field. And if even that person is in, isn't in that field, is there any person in the department who could guide me? Because you would need a supervisor, someone to supervise you. So if there is no one in that field, it makes it difficult and you wouldn't be. I think priority is given to those whose um, topics are in alignment with the department. Then as already said, strong letters of recommendation. I wouldn't go deeper into this because it's already touched on. And then statement of purpose. It runs through for all other programs, graduate school, even if you're applying for a second bachelor's degree, statement of purpose, letters of recommendation, it runs through all um, academia. Um, admission requirements. Well, I think um, it is important that you review the admission requirement for each PhD program of interest. It might be similar um, PhD um, degrees, but then the requirement might be different. So just as Banky said, and then the other presenter said, it is important that you go to the website of the university and then you read. Read and make sure you are um, providing the documents according to what they are requiring. If they do not request for anything, don't provide that. You only provide what is being requested. So it is important that you have ample time go to the website, take your time, and then go through the application process. Now, one other thing that um, you'll be required is interviews. Some PhD programs do not require interviews, but I think about 80% of PhD programs require that you go for an interview um, as part of the admission process. So you would have to prepare for these interviews by familiarizing yourself with the program and then articulating your research interests, discussing your academic background and um, goals. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is um, funding. Most for the US, United States, most PhD programs offer um, funding upon admission. As long as you gain admission, the PhD, um, your department or the university itself would grant you um, Ad, um, funding through assistantship. There are also fellowships that you could also apply to um, in the university. So in the application process, they usually ask, would you require funding? If you put yes, they would put your name up for every other funding that you would be um, eligible for. And then the highest is what will be given to you upon admission. For some universities, after you get admission, you would have to go for interview for the funding part of it too. Aside um, funding from the university itself or fellowship within the university that you could apply for, there are also external funding like um, Ghana's um, Get Fund. So there are some countries that provide um, funding for their citizens to study abroad. And Ghana has one, that is the Get Fund um, scholarship where people can apply to and they I think they fund fully for you. Most PhD degrees um, last for at most nine years. So for that duration of that nine years, you would be funded by the Ghana government from books to accommodation to tuition to um, health insurance, everything will be funded for you. And you could also apply for um, other forms of external fellowships like um, MasterCard fellowship. And um, yeah, that is the only thing that comes to mind right now, but there are other forms of fellowships that you could also apply for. Usually if you don't have any idea of where to start, Google is your best bet. Just go to Google, type in, if you want to study um, philosophy, what are the available fellowships for PhD in philosophy? And then it will pop up. So you just go through one after the other. Um, there are also professional associations. You could explore scholarship opportunities offered by professional associations in the field of study. Many associations would offer grants or scholarships to support research and then academic pursuits. So if you are in STEM, there are some um, organizations, if let's say you are working with KPMG, KPMG could offer you um, a study leave, a paid study leave 
and then you could use that to pursue. Currently, there's someone in my school, in my program, who is funded by her um, job. She's a lawyer. So the job funds that too. And that is also another form of um, funding. Yeah, I guess um, that is all. And then another way too that you could fund um, your PhD is by getting a student loan. But you, I mean, that could be a last resort because there is a lot of money in the system that you could tap into. So if you, I wouldn't advise that getting a student loan should be your first um, resort. That would be like, okay, I've explored all my options. Now there's nothing left for me. Then you could look into um, student loans. So just make sure that your application is very strong. When applying, take the time to craft a strong and compelling um application, which would include uh, writing a well-written personal statement or essay, secure strong letters of recommendation, and then ensure that all required documents are submitted accurately and on time. And then seek guidance. Don't hesitate to reach out to academic advisors um, or university financial aid offices, scholarship coordinators for guidance and support throughout the uh, application process. The trick here is ask. If you don't ask, information will not be given to you. And information in this system is gold. When you, you are ignorant, you lose a lot of things. But when you are informed, you stay on top of it, on, on your game. And you're able to tap into all the necessary resources. And it, it makes your life easier. So always ask, don't be shy. I know the culture that we are from, it's hard to talk to people because you feel like, yeah, hey, I just want to keep stuff to myself. I don't want people knowing my business. Please let people know your business. How else can they help you if they don't know your business? So always remember for the PhD, it's very competitive. And scholarship for PhD is also very competitive. So it is very important to start the search early you stay organized and put your best foot forward in your applications to apply for a PhD program. If let's say you want to um, begin your PhD studies come fall this year, um, say September 2024, you should have put in your application last year. You should have put in your application in 2023. So usually when people ask me, I always tell them to apply for a PhD program, you need to begin the application process the year before and when you put the application um, in early, you can be guaranteed that you would be um, selected for any fun. Usually it's a first come first serve because it's very competitive. A lot of people are applying. Um, the PhD program, it's very lonely. It is um, very stressful. So you need a mentor. It is important to find a mentor, someone that will guide you. These uh, mentors, usually there are people who are willing, they just want to impact the knowledge that they have to other people. So just reach out. You find out, oh, there's this person who already did this program, reach out to that person. You'll find that usually they are very friendly and they love to talk. You know, academ uh, people in uh, academia, they love to talk about what they've done and how big they are in the position that they are in. So talk to them and they will guide you on the steps. Sometimes you feel you are the path that you are, or you might think you're on the right path, but no, you are missing some key steps. When you have mentors who have already been in that field and have already gone the path, they can guide you on what to do. So for whatever field that you want to go to, find a mentor. And this applies to every aspect of our life. Whatever that you are doing in life, you should have a mentor. Your social life, you should have a mentor. Academic, you should have a mentor. Spiritual life, you should have a mentor is very, important because they can give you the expert knowledge on how to navigate the whole process. And then two, develop hobby, um, hobbies. Um, one big thing in PhD programs is the imposter syndrome, where you feel like, mm, everybody is so brilliant, everybody is so intelligent. I'm not intelligent. I don't know what I'm doing. Everybody faces this in the PhD program, but you need an outlet. And so developing hobbies become a um, an outlet for all the academic frustrations and challenges. And it will help you in that regard. It also helps to change your focus every once in a while and it helps you to distress. 
And then remember, uh, Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. It is not easy. It is very difficult. But we know that we have someone that will always lead us and direct us and make it successful unto us. Well, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doris Anderson. That was a very good one, and we really appreciate it. So my my dear friends and to some of us who are probably naive and inexperienced as to what to do as far as this process is concerned, there's a time for us to marshal our arsenals together and probably apply from right from our first degree. Before I forget, um, the person who just presented um, is one of our very own and she is the founder of Stand. Not too long ago, uh, I think we talked about Sabbath conference. So Stand basically has to do with Sabbath trial advocacy and network decks. So she is the founder of that, and they have been doing so amazing. And in in the voice of Pastor Ankoma, it's overwhelming. We really appreciate you so much for this time. I have. A couple of questions in my DM, and there's a time for me to read them to a to a to a hearing, and then our able presenters and to those who have joined from far and near, if there is a question that you think you can um, answer, please feel free to just relax by showing your hand, and I'm going to call you so that you can do that very well. So from what I have here, the very first question has to do with how many programs do you think I can choose when I'm when I'm applying to a school in abroad? How many programs do you think I can choose? One program, two programs, and so on and so forth. So what do you guys think, our presenters? Um, I think I can take this one. So um, apply as many as you can and as deep as your pocket because um, um, the uh, universities would require application fee. Sometimes you are able to get um, a fee waiver. Some universities do um, promotional um, events where they grant um, fee waivers where you can do the application for free. But most times you find out that you have to pay and it's quite expensive. You don't pay in CDs. You pay in um, the currency of that particular country that you are applying to. So it adds up. If you're applying to say about um, six programs and then let's say the amount they are requiring is even if it's ten dollars it adds up and you you end up not having the money so I would say I am not a fan of applying to a lot of programs I don't do that do the application well and then have the faith have faith and then trust that God will also do his part so make sure that you get all the necessary requirements that the school is requiring make your ad, um, application um, very strong and then pray and God will answer it for you because we don't have the money. So, <laughs> yeah, I would like to add something to what um, Doris said. So, so, Nani, I'm sorry about that. Once you, oh, you once you add up, you can also share your experience, as you said. Oh, okay. So yes. reading so, this time. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, so with what Doris says, please, if you know you are applying to three or four schools, make your mind now. Okay, make your mind now that okay. So maybe I know a Ben in this particular school, um, Andrew in the Lord in this particular school. So I've, I've searched and I want to apply for this school. And you've done all your search and everything, and you know that this is what you are doing. So after that, so that when you are working on your recommendation and the other material today, you won't send one recommendation to your your um, um the, the person writing your, the recommendation for you. And the next day or the next month, you won't send another. And you know, sometimes it can be boring. So you just make sure that you do, you start everything. You have five schools in mind. You start working on the applications as soon as possible. You send all recommendations. I know it's going to be a little bit um, difficult because of the um, the time range. But you send all recommendations to, to them. And I think that you, you, you'll be good to go. So with the number of applications you would like to apply, just like you said, if you have the money. And also try Three applications, you know, it doesn't kill. If you see them, two, three, three, three applications, just try them and 
get money and apply for uh, for that ones and add it to it, and it'd be good to go. But if you don't have money, please see, they give application fee waivers. That's why I, I always tell you, um, try to get in touch with the coordinator, okay? And not, I'm a communication student, so one thing I really understand is um, about you trying to have a personal co uh, conversation with the person. You know, sometimes look at the, um, the calendar of the United States, some programs they've been doing, some of the things they've been doing, and you may just send, okay, if it's uh, maybe um, like an event, okay, um, happy, happy, days. I'm just calling to, to, to just, you know, just a, a, you know, to create, to create a connection with that supervisor or that, um, that coordinator. So when you do that, you tell him or her that I want to schedule uh, an appointment with you and know more about the program. This is what I want to do. So when you do that, if he or she approves that, you tell the person, okay, so this is it. I, I want to apply for this program. I'm using my experience. I want to apply for this program. But looking at this, um, I, I, I'm finding it because due to financial constraints and if uh, I, I'm very, very happy if the department can support me with any waiver, okay, any waiver, any financial support for my application fee waiver. And also you keep them, you write, you, you make a statement that this is what I've been doing. This is my research. This is my academic performance. This is what I've been doing. And I, I, really, I think that I'm fit for this program. So you try to convince them um, through your emails or having a Zoom appointment with them. And I think you'll be good to go. With that said, with the experience I want to share with you is about mine. Um, I had the opportunity to evaluate transcripts of students for admission and other things. So um, way back um, on campus. So we were looking at the CGPA range of students, maybe from this and that, people having good CGPA, especially people coming from um, the Asian countries, some of them having this and that. So we were asked, my professor asked me, so no, um, I mean the, the chair, um, we're tasked to look for students who, who started from, let's say, you know, some of them who started from, let's say 2.5, 3.2, and they had the first class and other things. It's like, the, and I asked the professor, why should we do that? You know, can't we go for students who started from AA? No, and I was like, no, in evaluating this one. So this, I'm trying to create a connection to let you know that if you are struggling now, don't worry. Or if you have bad grades, don't worry. So to evaluate this one, we look for um, people who, some people started from 2.0. And finally, they had 2.0 and 2.5. They had 3.0. Like, it's like a systematic order. We look for these people who are able, who have been able to overcome challenges in the academic barriers. So we can see that they have been improving this semester, it's that, this semester, is this, and that. And also, if this right. person, also if, if they don't have, if they don't have the 3.0 CGPA cut to, okay, and they have to apply, um, and we look, looking at it, maybe 2.8, 2.5, we still give them opportunity to come in. When they come in, they'll take some prerequisite courses in there, okay, to help them, um, I mean, to, to push their CGP upwards. So we, we've done all these things before. When if your CGP is not, um, um, it doesn't meet the requirement, and they still tell you to apply, you do your best, apply. Don't tell yourself, oh, I'm afraid because I don't meet it. Apply. And they may get back to you that based on your CGP or something, they will require that if you, you would go ahead, you, you should you should do these courses or when you come in, you, you need to do these courses. To help right, you. right. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you so much, Banky. Uh, Sabat, I can see your hand up. Can you go ahead? Yes. So in addition to that, when you are doing the applications, for instance, like mostly these are... <laughs> Um, I should I should say it is good like we all aim high to get high based on your standards. Check on your standards and use that to apply for schools. If you are having a CGP of 2.5 or 2.7 or 3.0, Harvard is not ready to take you because they may have they they want they are high achievers. Undoubtedly, you don't go and try your luck like God would do. God, God it, here, I mean. Um, faith in God does not defy reason. Like I mean, that you should you should be reasonable, and and be realistic in your in your goal settings, career aspirations. So you, you should bear that in mind. And if you are a higher achiever, for instance, let's say I have a first class of 
3.9, it does not also necessarily mean that you should apply to all Harvardian schools. No, it doesn't work like that. Vary your applications because you don't know which schools may pick you. The important one is in the United States here is one. Will I get funding? Do they run the program that I, I am looking for? Do they, do they like, will I get, um, 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 uh, how do you call it? Um, um, advisor, these are essential things to consider. So vary your schools. When you look at the uh, US something something rankings, you can pick up schools that are like maybe first 100, 100 to 200, based on, like I'm saying, based on your, <laughs> your experiences. So check on your experiences and use that to build your search. So that will be very prudent. Again, I'm also coming to where you are doing the application. You should vary. I think Banky has already mentioned that I needed not to vary the application. Apply, apply to some free schools as well as then Doris own coming. Apply to paid um, application schools because mostly everyone is going for free because the the fees is is is, is um, high. So it means that there will be choke there. Therefore, if you are able to apply to maybe two schools that you pay for, it also enhances your chances. So we should do some of these variations. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. We have a couple of questions here. And anybody who raises their hand to answer a question, the person has 60 seconds. That's one minute. If I see that you are going beyond that, honestly and humbly, respectfully, I'm going to cut you short. Thank you for kind courtesy. Um, Inku Emmanuel, you can go ahead. Um, I think I also, the point has been raised already. Um, me personally, I applied to three schools. But before you do the application, you have to also gather some money. That is um one of um the important thing because um if you want to apply for paid internship like paid application schools or paid schools you're going to pay a lot because some of the application fees are as much as high that we can imagine when i applied to the, um, the schools i applied to pay two paid um schools and then none non paid schools unfortunately i got the one that i did not pay for any application fee but those ones that i paid for the application for almost 3,000, I didn't get it. So you have to weigh your balances. You have to know that um, application fees mostly are quite high because of the dollar rates. So just as it has been said, as you are applying for the paid ones, you also have to just look at the un unpaid ones. Maybe your chances of getting the unpaid ones are very high than the paid ones. Don't look at the paid ones alone, or else you might just throw mm -hmm. All your money is into that and then and with that being said you can just apply to as many as you want maybe five i, I applied to three schools and i got one i know somebody who applied to only one school and the person had it this is when god's grace comes in so in all there is kind of advantages and disadvantages but you just have to um pray that things will just um um get well by just weighing your balances with respect to um finances and respect to um the kind of schools that you want to go, it's also um a factor that you have to consider. Thank you so much. Um, just to just to add one more thing, what I want to say is that before you apply to every school, if it is possible, you can reach out to the program director, program coordinator, whoever that you want to reach out to. Some can give you a go ahead. That come on, you can apply, and trust me, it works. And also. We have this old the proverbs or whatever that yeah the nam if you want to get something out there, there is a price to pay for. I mean it is not easy all out, but sacrifice that we make, they are they are I mean worth it in the future. The next question here is um which aspects of the CV that I am supposed to, you know put much emphasis and she also added that with with the level of education you know where do i start from 
I said, when, when I want to write for my educational aspiration, do I have to start with SHS, JHS? Where do I start from? I want to add one more, which is also in line with that. How long should a, should a CV be? That's what the person is asking. Should it be four pages, six pages, one page, three page? How should that be? So we can also answer these questions and then probably we can move on. Go ahead, Anderson. Yeah, so um, one page. Beyond one page, that is too much. They don't have time. There's a lot of applications coming in. And if Banky will tell you, they don't have time to um, go through um, go through all those pages. So just one page. And if you're applying for master's, you put in your bachelor's degree. It's an international um, application you are doing. No one knows um, well, what are some of the names of the high schools. No one knows them. No more so don't, exactly. Don't, don't put it on. Start from your bachelor's degree, UCC. Then um, if you have a master's degree, you also put that master's degree on. And um, so the CV or the resume for school application is slightly different from your regular CV that you would use for a job application. So you also need to take note of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone to add a comment or two before I move on? I think this is well answered. And I mean, a page, I would also say it is highly subjective. You know, some might even... Uh, what do you call it? Prefer two or three, but as as first year, first year, what, what do you call it? Um, student, I think it will be very strange to have a CV of uh, six pages. I mean, you are not yet a professor to write books, so you know, a page or two should be fine. The next question is, with the component of the aspect outlined in the CV, some of us, aside our personal details. We have no further experience except our internship and probably our coursework. What do we do? That's one. I want to add one more for us to answer that because of time. Is it only a professor who can write recommendation for me? Is it only a professor who can do that for me? So let's answer these two questions and then we can take it out from there. Andrews, go ahead. Okay, so um, so the first question, uh, the first thing I want to touch on is, you don't it that is actually it's not a problem if you don't really have a work experience, you know, um, for the tech, for the tech field and not for uh, like the tech programs or majors, you know, one professor told me sometimes they look at your your um uh, professional experience. And when they realize you have much experience there and let's say your CGP is not really that high, sometimes they consider. Because let's say you are applying to, to study computer science and you want to major in like um, software engineering. And on your CV, you have like two, three years working experience at the software engineering field, you know, as a software engineer. Then obviously your your CGP shouldn't be yes. an obstacle, yes. right? But the, uh, I think uh, Mr. Evans touched on, on the fact that, you know, you're applying not for a job, but for a school. So even if you don't have a work experience, internship is actually, um, it's, it's also work experience, right? It's a working experience. So you can put that on, but you also, you'd want to lay much emphasis on your, like the programs or the courses you've done, right? I think that is uh, important. And also, you don't need only your like an academic professor to get your resume. Some schools will tell you, for example, we need two recommendation uh, two recommendation letters, and they'll tell you one can come from a professor from your school, and also like someone you work directly under your supervisor from your work place. For for instance, let's say you're doing the national service, so one recommendation letter can come from. Um, your professor or a lecturer, and then the other can come from your supervisor. But I would advise before you even embark on that, read on this, read the school's website and find out what specifically the school needs. Because some schools are strict. They'll like that's strict. They'll tell you they need a, a recommendation letter from um like an academic professor. 
right? So you just read the school, but you don't need um, only an academic professor to get you a transcript, uh, sorry, a recommendation letter. Thank you. Thank you, Senior Ben. Yeah, um, also, you don't necessarily, it's not only about, I think Andy has said, but I want to touch on the aspect of you, uh, the, the question I said that only internship. What did you do at your internship? This is what they need. So try to meticulously use verbs to slate down, to bullet the, the, the duties or your roles at the internship site or office. These are the essentials. So it is internship is something, you have done something. Also, like there were there are a lot of things people like myself, when you are on UCC campus or wherever in our campuses in Ghana, we are like that type of thing. So we don't really get engaged in school activities. Get engaged in extracurricular activities. Right now, like in NAS, me, I use my activities in NAS very well. Whenever I'm doing every any interview, ah, I bring issues about what I was doing at NAS, about your extracurricular activity. NAS is going for prison ministry and they are they are um um soliciting for food items and they are all volunteer services. So be engaged, be part of it. When there is a, any exercise you hear on campus, they, we are doing this cleanup exercise, be engaged, be involved. Because you want to bring up something they want. They are not only about your academic work. They also want to see the other side of you. What have you been doing on campuses? They value the small things here in the United States. <laughs> Let me appreciate this quick example. My professor, like my, my office supervisor, would tell, hi, Vanessa, we got some project for you. And I go like, oh, project? Let me go. I go and the project is like, I'm carrying one box from one office to the other. I said, project. Okay. Then he will be like, I put it on your CV. Like, oh, what is this? <laughs> so the, the small things are very, very important to these people as well. And be, be engaged on, on campuses or even on, in your committees, uh, wherever you find yourself. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. The next question is, um, because of time, I think we need to wrap up because um, it's past 8 p.m. and then people would have to attend to their staff. Can you, oh, sorry, can your pastor write recommendation for you? That's one. The second one is, I want to apply to a school in US uh, in this program, either microbiology, pathology, or immunology. Could you please assist me to apply and which schools do you think I can apply to? So let's answer these two questions. Can a pastor write for me as a recommendation and then can I also get a link to apply to those schools? Andrews, you can go ahead, please. Yeah, so I just specifically want to touch on the pastor part. I remember I was applying, you know, to a school in, in Sweden. And yeah, I made Pastor Nkuma write a recommendation letter for me. Yeah, so it's possible. But you ask yourself, how is he represent? How how is he being represented? In what basis is he writing the recommendation letter for you? So that's the, the most important question you have to ask yourself. Is he just writing the recommendation letter because he's a pastor? And is that gonna have any effect on what you want to apply for? I think in my uh, during my, my time, I made him write a letter as you know, he has a high position in school. So even though he attached the part that he knows me religiously, but he also attached his position there. So I think you should know as to what is being represented. Thank you. Thank you, Andrews. Inkum, go ahead. Sure, I was just going to touch on um the the pastor's aspect uh, aspects. So. I also had um Pasankuma, all the three applications that I made or that I, I did. It was um Pasankuma who um, um was part of the recommenders. So it's highly possible, but it, just as um Andy said, it's it depends on the um the direction that um the recommendation is being told to. So you have to take um take uh, into consideration somebody who has worked with you and who has 
that kind of official recognition um can equally do that um in 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 that regard so i think um it is possible that way yeah all right thank you um watcher sabas one quick thing and they also like that's why we always emphasize read 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 on the program website they emphasize that maybe three recommenders or three referees to at least one of them or two of them should be academic so here if you are all your recommenders are coming from non academic side you 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 should know that they don't really carry that weight even though they evaluate but they specify that maybe one at least one should be from academic so you should be able to get um your um uh, um lecturer uh, whoever taught you to really like uh, give you one of these yeah thank you all right thank you so much um income it's a honey tell up right no thank you. um yeah. is it you know someone is asking that you know uh, in ghana if you want to apply for a job or you want to apply for anything there'll be action of um experience probably two years three years four years is it is it equally uh what do you call it measured in terms of uh, 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 uh applying to schools in abroad probably there'll be a school that will be requesting two years experience even if that is the case which kind of experience would it be asking for the the next one we can also add is which month is the best month to apply i'm thinking this person wants to ask which intake is it, is it the fall intake the spring intake the summer which intake is it required for us to apply is anybody to available to answer okay Sabas. yeah um for the intake i am also understanding if uh, i mean the question i understood it from two aspects one was where, what you talked about and the other is me also understanding it when does he have to start the application yes right right if you are you you, you want to uh, go to school 2025 start from now prepare your materials from now you should be able to start from where Andy started. Search for schools. What are the requirements that they need? And that will help give you a headway that, okay, these are the requirements, so I should do this, this, this and that. By some, most schools, they start opening the applications from July. So July, I guess your applications should be ready. And most schools that give automatic funding also have a cap of submitting your application by maybe um 31st November 30th November or 1st December and you should be able to meet this deadline so it means that when you do all these backgrounds and you start working by now by uh, um July August of next year you are able to submit your your particulars or your document and by uh, um, um December 1st you will be able to get funding the other aspect too is that um mostly the fall admissions give funding. Uh, about 90% of the United States schools give funding in the fall. Mostly, I mean, there are uh, exceptions. Some schools give funding on a rolling basis. It depends. But then what I know so far as like, I mean, experience is, con is concerned that most schools give funding. And so if you are not self-funding and you want funding from those schools, they give funding in the fall. That is the August intake. Therefore, you should be able to apply early um, as possible so that you'll be able to get um, um, your, your application. So if you are applying for to next year, I guess, you want to go to school next year, I guess, by this year, July, you should be able to be submitting, preparing to submit your document. This year, July, August. So start everything, submissions, July, August, September, your application should be, be there. And then... By next year, everything will be cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Anderson, please, you can go ahead. Oh, um, yeah. I think he already touched on it. I, for international students, it's advisable to apply for fall intake. So don't go for the spring. Don't go for summer. Your best bet is fall intake. That's what you should apply to, and especially if you want funded. If you want funding, Make sure that the moment application opens, you put in your application because it's a first come, first serve um, basis. 
And someone also asked, I think the person already left the meeting. They sent a private message. Safo Benjamin Menu. You guys could tell him that I said most universities offer funding. Most US universities, they offer funding upon admission, master's, PhD, bachelor's degree. You can even get 100% funding, sometimes 90, 80% or 50%. So um, if they require an extra application for scholarship, it would, it would be stated in uh, on their website or in the, whilst you're doing the application, it will pop up. You will see it in one of the materials that if you want um, funding from the university, put in an extra application. Usually there is a link that will, you would follow to do the application. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like time is fast spent. I don't know how best we can move forward with the questions. I don't know. But maybe in the next seven minutes, or probably um 17 minutes, if I would say we need to end up so that people can have access to their time and then they can attend to whatever they need to attend to. Um, the next question I have here, lest I forget, there I have I have posted a link in the chat box. So that is the WhatsApp page. If you have any question that you think it needs to be addressed, just join the page and then put forth your your questions there. They will be answered. It looks like one person asks for a school that he can apparently apply for microbiology or those stuff. I think the best thing that you have to do is to search online, search, search the schools, and then you, you can just type the microbiology, and then the schools might pop up. And, I, and I'm very sure, sir, you can get it all set. Thank you so much for your time. What are some common challenges that students may face when transitioning back home after their studies? That's what one person is asking, too. Please, I am in level 100, offering data science and analytics please um please if i'm admitted will i continue from the same level or i have to restart two questions let's get this answered and then i think we have two or three more that will be the the last question that we can just wrap it up please did you get the questions one person is asking i'm done with school so in case I'm done with school and I want to come back home, what are the challenges? Will I have to fly back? Will I have to, you know, vanish? I mean, what are the yeah. challenges that are to back to I home? really Those vanish. Are to, um, I'm going to be a little bit like, now based on the person experience. Yeah. Yeah. So, and also if we are to delve into that, it's like we would, we would now move to a different direction of what like we are doing like, it's, of course, there will be challenges. Um, even when you come to um, the United States here too, there will be challenges. And if you are done with school, hopefully, if you want to come, it depends on you. You also want to stay or if you want to go to the um, go back to Ghana. Um, there are uh, other opportunities for you there to, especially going back home with a PhD. That's one important thing I also say. So I'm looking. I'm looking at what you said uh, earlier on. So you need to start. Yeah, you need to start. I mean, that's what, from my experience, you need to start because um, you said you are not done with school and you, you're just starting from, is it level 100? So when you come to the United States to start college, you, you they'll make sure that you start because it's a little bit different. The courses you, some of them are, if they, they if you have a transcript there and you submit your transcript, they are going to waive some courses you've already done for. So they're yeah, just going to waive it and if um, you, you have to move to a different level, like move from the 200 to the plan, they'll do that for you. But if you come, they'll tell you that you need to start. You start first, and now when you start, you submit your transcript and let them know, that, okay, this is what you have on your transcript, and this is what you want to waive. And they'll waive those courses for you, for you to transition to a different level. So that's what I know about okay, my experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. I appreciate Thank you. Um, Anderson, did you just speak or you are coming to speak? I am now coming to speak. Okay, go ahead. Yes, I am. Um, mm. You can also apply for, you can also apply as a transfer student. For, mm -hmm. we are talking about bachelor's degree, right? Right. Uh, first degree, yes. 
you can also apply as a, because you have some form of college experience, you can apply um, as a transfer student and continue. If it is the exact same program, you will just continue from where you left off based on the courses you've done um, on your from your transcripts. So you just continue from there. And if your GPA is good, if your GPA is not good, you would have to start from level 100. And um, the other person uh, that talked about going back to Ghana, it is called reverse culture shock. You know, when you leave Ghana to come to the US, you experience culture shock. You're like, hey, glass and coin. Oh, the roads are good. Yeah, that is culture <laughs> shock. And then when you go back home and you go like, mm, I want to go back today, that is the reverse culture shock. I mean, if you are going back home empty handed, it's it will it will be hard, but you can find a job before you go back home. You make sure that you have things set up for you. That will also ease you back into the culture, but it will take time. It will be difficult. Just as when you came here, it was difficult for you to adapt. When you go back home, you will now have to unlearn certain things that you learned here and then try to adapt to the culture back home as well. So excellent. That, that's, yeah, mm -hmm. all that I can say. You should hear it. Um, Sabat, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, in addition to that, like I'm talking um, in regard to, with respect to the one who said that they are in level 100. So <clears throat> in level 100, you do the transfer. And so Doris and Banky's point, uh, they, 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 they are valid. And together with that, they will not also do that in isolation. They will take into consideration your, your high school grade because like Doris uh, pointed out, that they see that your grade is, is very good. They will make they will do this um, transfer thing for you, but they will compare that with your high school results. I recently did a certificate course in, in um, high school credential evaluation, and they really, really, it goes through that kind of ev evaluation process. It's not just uh, like you, you are in the fresh year, so you just go straight, no. They will compare that to your high school results and see that okay, at least they are at par. Because when, but when they see like a vast difference, how come like you have this vast? Then they will start to be probing. It, it, it doesn't just take straight like that. There are processes that it it, it undergoes through. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Andrews. Yeah. So um, briefly, I want to touch on. Let's say you you've completed school. There's a reason why. At the beginning of my, you know, during my presentation, I recommended, if possible, get a STEM-related, you know, program. The reason is for STEM-related programs, once you complete, you have three years to do OPT. So you first do OPT for one year, and after one year, you can extend for the next two years. So let's say you came to the States to study, and you have in mind to travel back to Ghana, which I know is really rare. The one shouting. Yeah. All right. So you, you want to. Oh, please, it's not Ghana. all of us. We want to go back home. <laughs> okay. So, at least for STEM related programs, you have three years to work. Right. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's that's what I want to say. So, I really encourage if you can get the STEM program, that's that's good. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, if, if the person uh, probably have the chance to go and then sit there and then you can just go back after one month, that's okay. Uh, there's no problem with that, you know. But it's yeah. good to give back to the to 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 the country, of course. But then the uh, the Ghana we have wanted. Anderson, one minute. Yes. So um I know um Andres has been touching so much on STEM, STEM, STEM. Those of us who don't have that um, interest in STEM. I mean, we don't have that potential in STEM. Me, me, for instance. So those of us who are like me, you see, <laughs> you still can do OPT for one year. When the one year is up and then your um, company is not willing to sponsor you for the H-1B visa, apply for another master's degree or another um, bachelor's degree in a different field. Like there are mm -hmm. ways to work the system. That is why I said, get a mentor if you want to travel to the u.s get a mentor specifically for that and let the person guide you in right. the process right. so it's not just them if i know someone will be thinking hey na me, 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 me interest was the man then please don't worry we in the humanities and the social sciences we too we are here okay and then right. we are there, right. there are ways to work around the system as of well. course humanities we we, we call it uh, what they call it appreciate you guys 
take your one year and all the best. Um, uh, um, one person also asked about which month to apply, and Anderson made it clear that it is a, a good for us to apply for the fall, which is very good. But hey, you can equally try for the spring semester because I know people with full funding for the for the spring semester. It does happen, but then ordinarily, if you want full funding, the best intake to apply is the fall. So if probably one of your documents were not available and you want to apply for the spring, go ahead, just pray about it and do what is needful. Prayer goes with work. The last question I have here is, um, what would be your advice to someone wanting to pursue masters in higher education? I mean, what would be the key requirement for such an individual or how can a such person hold that, hold that position for himself? So, this person apparently want to um apply for masters in higher education, which we have people here to answer that question. So, what are the key requirements? Is it anything that needs to be done so special for us to achieve that? Um, you can just answer that, and then we can wrap it up. Okay, so I am into higher ed, and mostly, if it's like purely higher education. Have you done any education program? Are you into education proper? So that is one of the basic things. It does not also mean that if you have not done anything in education related, you cannot be picked. And so you should understand that some applications are they are reviewed on a case by case basis, case by case basis, because sometimes your program maybe you have done statistics and you want to come and do higher education with a concentration in program evaluation. The fact that you've done statistics is, is okay because program evaluation is more of statistics and, 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 and um, how do you call it? Research statistics and evaluation analysis basis. In this way, even though you are doing a higher education with an interest to be an administrator where, where, with, an, uh, um, with a concentration in uh, institutional evaluator, so you want to be a, the evaluator, evaluation officer for the university. This does not really necessarily require you to be in, in uh, uh, um, to have education background, but they will let you, they will guide you to see which courses you need to take. That will give you a feel of how to work in the education system because you will do um, education administration courses that will fit you well into the system. But your main motive to be in um, uh, assessment and evaluation is very, very important in higher education program and, and administration. So that's how it works. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sabat. Anderson, and we go for under, uh, income. Yes. Um, for some of us, we didn't know that we would still be in academia. We didn't know that this is the path we'll be on. So it is totally fine if right now you are not aware, you don't know what you want to do. Just enjoy your bachelor days, um, your bachelor degree uh, days. Don't don't stress yourself too much thinking higher education, postgraduate, relax and go one step at a time. That is mm -hmm. totally okay. I didn't know that I would do my master's and then come and do my PhD. I didn't know that. But then when it presented itself, I did go through. I mean, I know that we are saying prepare early and stuff. If it doesn't happen for you that you get to prepare early, that is also totally okay. You can also work around it. And then um, what um, Sabat said about um, you transitioning to a different program, it is entirely possible. I read um, philosophy and English in UCC. My master's degree had nothing to do with English language. And the PhD I'm doing, the correlation between the PhD I'm doing and my master's degree isn't that strong. So it doesn't really matter. Here in the US, there is flexibility. It is only in Ghana that if you study become, then automatically you must do something become for your master's degree or for your PhD. It doesn't work that way here. There is flexibility. Because um, the, the educational system here is such that even if you have no background in it, you are able to take introductory courses in it that um, like brings you at par with your other colleagues. So don't worry about it at all. If you feel like, okay, I did um, French, now I want to transition into STEM, like Andrews, don't worry at all. It is totally easy. 
all that you need to do is to prove to the um, admissions committee why they should take you. What 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 uniqueness are you bringing to? Um, are you bringing from your French background to the IT program that you want to study? That is all mm -hmm. they need, and you'll right. be fine. Yeah. Thank you so much, Income. Um, just to add, I am also into a higher education program here. And um, this year, I got a chance to have a glimpse of how the students were actually um, selected, even though I was not part of the, the committee. But um, in most cases, you, you just have to, like, it depends on the, the requirements. For my program in the higher education, if you have a CGP of below 3.4, you will not be admitted. So um, even though it does not need any um, any major um, prerequisite in that regard, because I read education, Bachelor of Arts, or Bachelor of Arts in Education, English and Higher Language, but I am doing higher education. I know some of the students who were admitted, my, my cohort, one person read um, business management in UCC, but he's doing higher education here. So it does not, it doesn't have any program specific antecedents for you to get into higher education program, but you have to check on the program website or the department's website to check the program requirements. Because for this year, they solely like, the, the attention was on the resume and then the um the CGPA. So if you, if, if you have a CGP below 3.4, automatically those people were brought out. So I think um, you shouldn't have any special need. You can read any program, but um, per the program or per the department's requirements, it should also give you a broader perspective of what you should um, be expecting of or what you should you should do if you, you want to go into higher education it is it doesn't have limits to any program it is just open but there are requirements you have to also look at for on the program or on the department um websites thank you so much thank you our uh, presenters thank you nas ucc thank you everyone who participated we really appreciate your time and your audience um i can see doris hand up yes i wanted to say one last thing um, course, don't worry so much about your GPA. I have um, a story to share. For my master's degree, I my GPA didn't qualify me, but I did get admission. So mm -hmm. um, apply anyway. If the cutoff point is 4.0, apply anyway and send God the bill. God will pay up for you, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's apply as many as we can, and God will surely take care of the bill. Trust Hello, me. Jeremiah uh, 29, verse 11. Sorry. Hello. says that he has a plan for us. So if God's plan is that this year you need to go to the States or you want to go to Canada, you want to go to UK, the plans will surely come to fruition. Banky, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, so finally, I'll be, I have um, a list of schools I've compiled. So I'll share that with you so that you share it with the uh great, the great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I have Thank a lot, you, so you know, it's almost about two two hundred and something or thousand so schools in the United States. So I'll share it with you so that right. you to share it. Thank you so much. Somebody once said that the schools in the states are apparently more than the, the people living in central region. That was just uh, what they call it. A funny story. I'm sorry about that, but that was what somebody shared with me now we've been talking about stem stem what is a stem program a stem program is an educational initiative focused on the disciplines of science technology engineering and mathematics so if if your program in a way aligns with these areas it is a stem program and i want to thank our presenters and our speakers for taking time out of their busy schedules you know they, they have a lot of assignments and projects to go through, but if they've, they've, they've put all this aside, it explains to us how much they care for, for, for us and how much they want to give back to NAS UCC, preferably. With that being said, to the organizers of this program, we want to appreciate you so much. Whatever time you have spent, whatever resources that have gone through it, we really appreciate that and God bless you so much for 
uh, I mean, uh, what do you call it? Going through all this so as to make this program a very wonderful one. Um, please make your slides available. I'm going to share them on our WhatsApp page. And as Banky said, personally, I have a number of schools that have equally compiled there. Once we come on board on the WhatsApp page, we are going to show you that and any question that you think you need it, you need to ask, feel free and ask these questions there. And I'm very sure your questions shall be answered. When we are about beginning, I said that it is a journey that we want to take and it boils down to academic excellence. God appreciates excellence. So in every field that you find yourself, do your best. Let God take care of the rest. And trust me, our efforts wouldn't go in vain. And God will surely meet us at the point of our needs. To our participants, we really appreciate you so much for your time. I miss this head work, network, hustle, and so on and so forth. You spend time. You have to maneuver your way out to get a network to join us. God richly bless you. And I'm pretty sure your, 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 your questions have been answered. If not, let's get in touch. And then I'm sure that these things will be addressed. Um, we are going to invite one person from NAS UCC. If anybody is available, be it being the uh, fellowship president, whoever is, whoever is available at the moment to pray with us as we wrap up everything. I don't know if there's something that I need to say. Andrew, Sinkum, Eugene, do you think I've missed something out? No, I think, yeah, that's all. We just appreciate them. Right, 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 right. So once more, if anybody is available to pray, because I can see NAS UCC in the participant list, but as to whoever is in charge or whoever is leading, I can't tell. So... If you are the president, you have anybody to pray with us. Yeah. To... Huh? Mm -hmm. President Kwache, uh, when you meet, uh, who is praying with us? Uh, Hello, nice UCC. Can we hear you? I think the network is very problematic over there. Sorry about that. Um, anybody yeah. from this can pray with us for us to end the program. Shall we pray? Yeah. Who is praying? Go ahead. Okay. We thank you, dear Lord and Master Jesus, for such a wonderful dialogue that you've made us engage in. We pray that you shower your blessings upon every word that we utter. We uttered. If in our utterances by any means we made a mistake, we pray that you forgive us and help us so that our brethren who are back.